Ashish, uh, welcome. Thanks for taking the time and uh, joining me today. What I'd like to talk about is to get to know you a bit more. What drives you, your interest, your passion. Yeah. And maybe we can begin with uh, where you came from, because I think you've got an interesting story. Yeah, so I, I don't think there are too many people uh, had, had that good fortune. So, so I'm sorry, I was a globetrotter from way back when, when I was born in India. Um, the initial, my, my father was training in the UK, and the thoughts were the family was going to move to UK, but by the time we were ready, he had moved to Guyana. So I went to Guyana, and I was there till high school, and then the family was concerned about my future, and I was sent to school in the UK. Um, and most of the time, I, I, I lived in the UK for almost 20 years. Then it became time for me to drive my own career, and the initial opportunities were in Canada. I went to Canada, back to Scotland, to the U.S., and of course from the U.S. to Singapore. <laughs> so, How was it living in Guyana? Um, you know, Guyana was very colonial. Um, it was a turbulent time for Guyana. It was trying to get independence from the U.K. Um, there was a, a community of people that were from an African background and then another from an Indian background. And, and they were pretty intolerant of each other. There were riots, <laughs> burning of houses and things of that time. And that was around when Jagan was the... Yes, Chetty Jagan was the uh, prime minister and then he was ousted and then the Queen's government installed... Uh, prime minister of an African origin, and, and that stabilized the country, even though he was not the most popular. So, so did you get into music when you were growing up, Arte, given the Caribbean? Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, <laughs> I've, I've always loved music because my, uh, my mother was a piano teacher. And we were all introduced to music very early age. I have to say that, you know, the, the one, one issue I would always say is that my piano, our piano, used to be in, in a bay window in, in the house. And so the piano player always looked outside. Mm. Don't do this to a child because they can see their kids, their friends playing, playing outside. outside. <laughs> <laughs> and they do not want to practice piano. <laughs> so when myself, we got a piano and my son was taught piano, we turned the piano the other way around so his back was to the window. <laughs> So you play music, right? Instruments? Uh, unfortunately, it's a skill set that needs to be maintained. Okay. So um, once I got into science, life got a little busy, and, and I haven't played piano. But it's one of my ambitions to go back, perhaps when life is a little s slower, <laughs> closer to retirement. And so how did you get into uh, science? What led you to um, it's a kind of a complicated story. I had actually thought about being an artist first. And I went to art school for a number of years. Uh, but I was also convinced that art simply wasn't, well, I guess I lack confidence in my own ability in art. Although I, I, have, I collect lots of art, I buy lots of art, and so I, I know the kinds of art I like. So it's a big passion of mine. Um, having said that, my other love was biology biology and mathematics. And I was looking for an opportunity to be artistic, but at the same time be concrete. But those are the two halves of my personality. And um, out of the blue, when I came time for applying for university, I got a phone call from University College London Biochemistry, said, we have only one slot. We think you're the person. Would you come and interview? And until then, actually, I'd been thinking about going to medical school. My father and brother and a number of my family members are MDs. And I came back. That one day, I was so energized. I took the train from Leeds to London. I interviewed in the biochemistry department, and I knew this was my home. And I came back, and I, I, I have to be frank with you, my father was rather disappointed. <laughs> but you didn't go into medicine? I didn't go into medicine. Okay. I, I don't think I've ever regretted that decision. It was sort of spontaneous, but that also tells you a little bit about the way I make decisions, too. Mm -hmm. but I gathered my facts when I went there, but there was a passion about the people that they approached their work, the 
kinds of things that they wanted to contribute towards. And I think that was just Is there strong. something specific that... Um, so, you know, I, so I, I, I'll tell you another rather short story. I, I got involved because of the mathematics biology angle. I was very interested in enzymes, how enzymes work, and, and, and understanding the kinetics and sort of detailed mathematical stuff. So when it came time for my to do a PhD, I, I um, interviewed at the University of Bristol with the number one enzymologist in the UK. His name was Henry Gutfreund. And he and I met one day, and he said to me, you know, Shreesh, you need to be with living, breathing biology. He said, enzymology is rather dry. And I can tell that won't keep you happy. So he rejected me from his lab. Mm. <laughs> Another person that did a wonderful favor because it steered me towards that which is, lead, you know, more physiological things that may allow me to evaluate disease mechanisms, perhaps do something about them somewhere along the line. Um, so you can tell there have been these twists and turns in these decisions, guided so did, by very good people. Though. So you finished your PhD in? In the UK. Okay. I did biochemistry PhD in, at the University of Leeds. Right. Uh, and then it became time to fly and decide. So you went to Canada. I went to Canada for a short period of time. It was a wonderful experience. Um, Canada was very vibrant, the, the, the personalities, it, it's sort of American in some level, very um, pioneer-like in, in the way people approach life in general. They were very outdoorsy people. But I think I, it was a shock to me after the first year as a postdoc in Canada. I, I was in Calgary, very close to the mountains and lakes, wonderful time. I felt that I was losing time in building my own career, and I needed quickly to make a change and find a lab that had a strong rec reputation and had sort of energy and drive to, to do things in a hurry. And um, going back to my undergraduate supervisor, he was my mentor, he, his PhD student had started a lab in Dundee. He said, well, it's kind of a quiet place. This guy is very aggressive. You're going to hate working for him. But I think it'll be do you the world of good. So he sent me to interview with his graduate student who was starting out in Dundee. His name was Philip Cohen. He's now Sir Philip Cohen. Mm. And I have to say the interview was abysmal on my part because the kind of science I was doing was tiny compared with what he was doing. So I'm a little shocked that he took me. What was he doing? He was working on glycogen metabolism okay. and, and glycogen storage diseases, and it's still very biochemical, but, but thinking broadly about animal models and... and so more of a systems... Exactly, okay. exactly. So I think that's the way the man thinks, and that was very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say one wonders why he took me, because I was thinking rather myopic <laughs> in terms of molecules. And not about process. Um, but luckily he offered me the job and I spent three years there. I must say that it was both hard, uh, traumatic in terms of the pace of things, uh, a lot of anxiety whether I was contributing adequately. But to be honest, that defines my career. That experience in Dundee is who I am still all these years later. So how did you land up at Duke? Ah, well, the, <laughs> another sort of a story of serendipity. I was, uh, at the time that the position at Duke was offered to me, I was a, an assistant professor in pharmacology at University of Texas in Houston. And um, Tony Means, who became the chair of pharmacology, was in the cell biology department at, uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. And on Fridays, we would meet at a local pub to talk about science in their place and our place and have a good old time for an hour and a half every Friday. So we became, we were friends before. And he had been looking at chairs and, and wondered whether I would join his team. And he had been thinking as a biochemist, again, it was very much my kind of science. And I suggested to Tony at the time that, so in fact we did look at a position 
myself, him, and two other people in biochemistry in Miami at the time. Uh, and Tony wanted to find an environment which had the kind of aura, the, the reputation of a Stanford or a Duke. And as it turned out, the pharmacology chairs at Stanford and Duke were vacant. And I suggested to him, why didn't he apply for those? And he said, I'm not a pharmacologist. I said, neither am I, but I've been living in a pharmacology department for six years, and I thoroughly love it. It's a blend of biochemistry, physiology, genetics, everything that you could bring to the table. And lo and behold, if he didn't apply to Stanford and to Duke and got interviews there and, and then got an offer at Duke. So needless to say, he said, well, you know, I don't know anything about pharmacology. I really now need you to come along because you have been that living in yeah. So um, again, a pure piece of luck. Um, it, another life changer because it upped my game in terms of the kind of science I did. I was surrounded by colleagues of such high stature that it's hard to do a little science under those circumstances. Um, I was visiting Durham last week, and, and I visited uh, our latest Nobel laureate, Bob Lefkowitz. And I had to remind Bob that when I came to interview, he was on my list, and a number of other people, Bob Bell and others. And when I went for my interview at Duke, I said to my wife, you know, I don't know whether I can handle this. These are top-notch people. I don't consider myself in the same rank. But I was reminding Bob that when I came to his office, Bob has a way of, of putting his hands behind his head and putting his feet on the desk. Table, yeah. When he is truly relaxed and, and, and expounding on great matters. <laughs> <laughs> and I found within an 30 minutes, my feet were on his desk too. He made me that relaxed. <laughs> So we've had a fabulous, you know, those are the sorts of mentors that made a big difference to me. And I think I, I began to realize that what one can do if you're in the right kind of environment with the right models around you and the expectations are high, it's fiery, but it's what one needs to pull the best out of it. Then you made another change, right? <laughs> I did. Uh, you know, somewhere along the way, I, I had a wonderful career, and I had been at Duke for a number of years and uh, risen through the ranks, professor, had some responsibilities as the vice chair of pharmacology. I proudly say that it was one of those departments. You know how vice chairs are often appointed by chairs? But I was appointed by the faculty, by a vote of the faculty. That's very unusual. That's very unusual. We had to persuade the chair that he needed a vice chair. And the faculty suggested that I would be the person. Um, it, very gratifying. It, 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 um, it, it tells me the things I like to do, that is, to spend time worrying about other people and how they're doing their science and what we could do as a group to help them along. So that was a great exposure. Um, but then the question is, would I want to be in charge of my own department? That question came up, and I, I looked at a number of chair positions. And I have to say, there were several that were extremely attractive. The deans that I met with were so supportive, I felt that we could be a great team and do something wonderful. But there was one, one nagging pro problem for me. That is, most of our graduate students at Duke, and, and in fact, in University of Texas, um, their job opportunities were in, in industry. And somewhere in there, I was totally convinced that we were underserving them in terms of training them for that environment. That's where they were going. So I decided that I would take a sabbatical and try to explore what science and industry was like. The business of science, which I thought might be thrilling and will grow me too. So I did a sabbatical with Park Davis. And during the time that I was doing my sabbatical, they were bought out by Pfizer. A very traumatic event, by the way. A company, a big fish eating a little fish is not fun. So this um, was when you were in Ann Arbor? I was in Ann Arbor, yes. Okay. And it was against that background. You know, so I, I had a lot to say about the training of scientists there, career scientists. By the same token, I, you know, I saw that there were struggles on their side. It's hard to be in the literature like it is in academics because there's so much other stuff to worry about in industry. 
And surprisingly, my sabbatical ended, and I went back to Duke. A year and a half later, I got a, a letter from Pfizer saying, remember those ideas you had about training of our scientists? Would you like to come for a couple of years and try that? And again, it just felt like the kind of opportunity that you don't get very often. So I took a leave of absence from Duke and went to Pfizer. Um, within a year, I was offered a senior position there. Um, so that meant extricating myself from Duke. So I uh, essentially gave up my position at Duke, faculty position. But Duke was very generous because I had research grants at the time, and I had students. And they allowed me to have a presence in Durham. So again, it was a very safe decision that I made in the sense that I had a foot in both communities. And actually, that made me better at Pfizer. Um, and needless to say, the two years became six years. <laughs> Time flies. Uh, and until yet another trauma, which was the site closed in, in Ann Arbor. This is one of those things that pharmaceutical companies are going through a lot. Um, they have some uh, enormous resources, enormous opportunities, but the marketplace drives their decisions. And they had to make a critical decision about saving about several billion dollars, and Ann Arbor site was exactly the correct size. So the site closed. And needless to say, that brought me yet another opportunity. <laughs> it was a good thing for us. <laughs> but yes. let me come back to your research a little bit. So yes. Tell me how your research started, where, where it went, and where is it now? Right. You know, I, uh, as, I, as I indicated that, I, I have a sort of an enzymology biochemistry background. So I had, uh, I, I think the real breakthroughs came when I went to Dundee. And we were talking about how it is that hormones signal within cells, how are enzymes utilized in the signaling cascades, and, and, and what goes wrong in disease models. So um, it turns out that the principles that we learned in Dundee in glycogen metabolism had much, much broader implications in many other systems and many other tissues and diseases. And so my uh, another sort of fortuitous meeting with a, a well-known neuroscientist, Paul Greengard, I felt like I could contribute in the arena of these enzymes that I had learned in muscle that control glycogen metabolism and asked the question, would they affect neural biology, neuronal signaling? Uh, I have to say, it was a wide open field, so it was a very quick win for me. And in a relatively short time, became recognized as, as someone who was looking at signaling at the level, level of the synapse. Um, since then, many others have jumped in, and the, and the field has just gone wild. Uh, progress has been tremendous. Um, so, you know, the, the, the decisions on where you should invest your money or your time or your opportunity is, is both looking at your strengths and what you can do, your interests, but also what the competition looks like, what the landscape looks like, where you have a very short career. You want to make the most of it. So you look to see where where you can make the most uh, impact. So when I came to Singapore, I had to, again, re rethink exactly. And there was an area in which we had made some modest forays, and we thought that this could really open up a new air place where we can make impact. At that time, the same signaling molecules seemed to be responding to stress. They seemed to be going erratic as aging. So this brought me to aging-related diseases, which are chronic diseases, difficult to understand and difficult to treat. Um, and so I made my decision to not work in, in, in metabolic disorders, uh, not work in the neuronal system, but focus all on stress signaling. I have to say happily that it still brought me back to neuronal signaling and to metabolism. metabolism. <laughs> So it's ironic that you, you never go too far away from where your strengths are. Um, but 
I think we have a, you know, again, it, it, when you restart, it takes a while to establish itself. And, uh, I think we're just about to make the kinds of contributions that I'd like to do in Singapore. It's taken a little bit of a while. Talk. The other part of your interest, as you said, was grooming the next generation. Right. And you spent time doing that at Duke, and uh, you clearly spent a lot of time getting it started and growing it here in Singapore. So what drives you, and what do you tell people? You know, I, I feel um, <laughs> there, 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 I think it's the obligation of all of us as we, as we mature and learn things to save the next generation some of that time if we're going to pass on our, our experience. At the same time, I think that the world is changing in science, so uh, one has to be careful that you're not teaching 20-year-old ideas to the next generation, because they may or may not be relevant. Um, so it's, so the, coming to Singapore offered me a very interesting opportunity of saying, do I want to think about training from a perspective of the future? Can I even predict what the future might look like? Can I take a more business-like approach to the training and save people time? How do you organize yourself? How do you put together a good idea? How do you get the right kind of assistance collaborators to make the project move? Um, and, 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 and it seemed like a, Singapore gave me a blank page, in essence. And, and that's, uh, that's the wonder of this particular uh, adventure. So I feel that, that my goal was to, to make sure a PhD student who didn't necessarily see patients understood the issues, just a few issues, concepts, that would make a difference to the patient from a clinical perspective. At the same time, understand how you take basic science and move it into a more uh, applied arena. So we began to think about a graduate program whereby you would say to students, PhD or MD, PhDs, and we want them to be in the same environment so they influence each other, how do you discover drugs? What are the various molecular entities that form effective drugs? How do you model a human disease in an animal? What's the limitations? What are the benefits? What diseases can you tackle quickly? And what are the diseases that are remaining big challenges? Um, so I think you know we, we created uh, a rather simplistic course called Molecules to Medicines. But the message is in the title of that course, and, and it, it talks to students about human trials, clinical trials, drug discovery, at a very nominal level, but still. My, my main goal is that the PhD student that comes out of Duke and US is going to go for that interview in industry and is going to know something about what they're signing up for. So I they know the context and exactly, the background. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, so for example, I, I, one of my saddest experiences, whilst I was at Pfizer, I interviewed a number of Duke PhDs for positions, I think 15 or 16, and didn't hire any. Now, I bleed blue. That hurts. Mm -hmm. And I can't have that for the Duke and US PhD. And the reason the Duke PhD failed in those interviews is that when you ask the question, why do you want a job in industry? What do you know about industry? They were unable to answer that question. If you said, how well do you work in teams? Do you enjoy collaborative atmosphere? They said, no, I prefer to work by myself. Well, big problems in biomedical research are not going to be solved by individuals. They're by teams. So I want the Duke and US PhD student to be embrace collaboration, understand collaboration, the value of it, and not be frightened of it. Um, so, you know, some of those concepts we've tried to put into the Duke and US PhD program. Only time will tell whether we succeed. So you started off your career essentially South America, <laughs> Caribbean, <laughs> England, Canada, right. US, yes. and finally back to Asia. I am, yes. So as you've gone through all these yeah. geographical uh, travel journey, how do you like Asia? How has it turned out for you? Well, you know, that's something that we don't, I, I don't get a chance to talk very much about. I, you know, remember I was born in India, and I have sort of been going westwards ever since. 
I'm at Singapore. I'm almost back to where I began. Um, I think it was an important part of my journey to Singapore is to, to get a feel for where I started, what is part of me. Um, to be honest, I ignored that part of me for many years. I wanted to be more Caucasian than Caucasian. Um, and that's a, a more childlike response, trying to fit in into a new environment. But I've done this in many countries, in many circumstances. So that part's no longer that important. Um, I feel very Asian, to be honest. You know, I've always felt that, um, although almost nobody says that. <laughs> People have confused me with being Mexican, uh, Arabic, anything but Indian. <laughs> but they do know that the name is Indian. Indian. Yes, they, they doesn't quite fit into Arabic or, <laughs> or any other place. Um, I have family in India. Um, it's a very, very big part of my heart is still in India. Um, I'm a big fan of Bollywood movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing that's missing, actually, if, if, if I'm, is I've never collected any Indian art. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> it is, but you know, I, 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 and it's not because I haven't looked. Um, but perhaps that tells you that my, my taste in that area has changed over the time. But I've bought Thai art, I've bought Burmese art, I've bought Vietnamese art. So if there's a gap, that's the gap. That's a gap. That's a regret, I think. I have to fix that somehow. So your journey really, you've picked up pieces from everywhere you've gone. Yes. So it's probably made you truly a global person in many ways, from right. Right. Caribbean, uh, Indian roots to uh, Canadian, uh, British, and <laughs> American, and now Singapore. Well, I like to think I got the best of everything. Um, you know, I tell when I speak to high school students, I says I was a globe trotter before the globe trotting was a fad. <laughs> so, what's, what is your passion? What drives you? Uh, I, I think that um, this is going to sound very trite, but I, I want to be in a position to say two things. One is do I know what I'm capable of, and have I really explored that to the fullest? I tell people that uh, the worst nightmare I can have is to be retired sitting in a rocking chair at 65 and said, oh my goodness, I could have done more. I don't want that. That I'm not going to accept. The second aspect is that uh, I, I do think that it's our job to change the environment that we're in, everything that we touch. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious responsibility. It's, it sounds heavy. It's actually quite easy and very rewarding um, to take every opportunity and, and, and make it work for you. And you learn a lot about yourself. You grow. And that's very gratifying. But with a bit of luck, you leave a little of yourself somewhere else, too. Um, so I, you know, those are the big drivers for me. It, it's kind of a general sense. Shush, thank you. I think you've left. Uh a lot more than a little in <laughs> Singapore. And I hope you continue to uh, have a connection to Singapore, interact with our people as we move forward, and play a role in shaping the school. So thank you very much, and thank you for spending the time. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate, and I hope to continue. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>